my sense has become over many years, and I find myself saying it, open yourself up to the world and the world will open up to you. And I really, I have lived that. I, um, well, it's been about eight years now I started traveling internationally more. I got out of an eight-year relationship and I just kind of took off. And I remember the moment that I was like, I need to let go of this LA uh, exclusiveness or too cool for, for this or whateverness <laughs> and be in the moment. And I did that and it really, you know, it opened up so many parts of myself and led me down so many roads and it connected me with so many people all across the globe. And, you know, I do, I go places by myself. I meet up with friends at certain points. At certain points, I'm alone in countries that people would never really even, you know, think to do that. And it's really given me some of the most amazing experiences. I've DJed in some of the most amazing places. I mean, I'll go, I'll go to Barcelona and I'll have zero gigs booked and I land and this DJ is like, oh, on Tuesday, you want to come spend with me here? And blah, blah. And it's not about the money. Um, it's the experience. And and then it's me playing 90s hip hop that I love so much. And them knowing every word. And I'm in the middle <laughs> of Spain. What? Um, but open up. And, and it's more than just DJing. It's it really uh, open yourself up to the world and the world will open up to you. Welcome to season two of the Amani Experience podcast. In this podcast, you will experience wisdom, advice, and stories from creatives all over the world. Your host is the award-winning Amani Roberts, who is a DJ, music producer, professor, voracious book reader, and a skilled chef. On the show, we love to share the stories of creative professionals, especially people who have gone from the corporate life to the creative life. Once again, welcome to season two of the Amani Experience Podcast. Welcome to episode 55 of the Amani Experience Podcast. For this episode, we have DJ Michelle Pache with us. It took Michelle and I a while to coordinate and get a date on the calendar to have this interview, but I'm so glad we stuck with it and made it happen because it's such a lovely interview. We had so much fun. Three things I really liked about this interview, among many of the great things we discussed, was just how Michelle has worked her way up from the bottom and done all the work that's necessary to be a successful DJ. She travels all around the world DJing different events, award shows, parties, like she'll do a party in a club, then she's at the Grammys, the Emmys. She's incredibly diverse, plus she's more than just a DJ, which we talk about in the episode, so love that. She's funny, you'll hear us laughing throughout the entire episode, it was hilarious, we just had a great time chatting and reminiscing, even getting a little personal. And speaking of personal, like I really liked how she was vulnerable and open and talked about personal things, which just lets us know that she's human. So I really think you're going to like this interview. Thank you very much, Michelle, for making it happen for us. I'm glad to share it with everyone. Remember, if you want to reach me, you can email me at podcast at amaniexperience.com. Make sure that you subscribe to the podcast. Give us a rating. It'll help our visibility. Thank you very much for listening. And to the show we go. Our guest today grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, with a deep love for 80s and 90s hip hop and pop. During her burgeoning career in public and personal publicity at the entertainment PR firm Wolf Casteller, she worked with some of the top actors and musicians in the world. Our guest attended Woodstock in 1999 and was moved by the energy created when you mix some of the world's best musicians and 200,000 fans. It was through that three-day experience that she was inspired to begin DJing and soon after bought a set of techniques, turntables, to teach herself the craft. A year later, she was introduced to DJ Spinderella from Salt and Pepper, who served as a mentor and helped launch her in the LA hip hop scene. In 2004, our guest made the tough decision to leave her reputable publicity career and focus on DJing full time. Since then, she has become one of the most sought after DJs, performing at private parties and clubs in France, Spain, Kenya, Uganda, Canada, Haiti, and Mexico, and is a staple in the Hollywood event scene. I would like to welcome Michelle Pace to the Amani Experience Podcast. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So we're very excited you're here. It's been a long time coming. I'm so happy we <laughs> stuck with it. I'm so happy to have you here. <laughs> it's been a long road to make this happen. But it's good though. But I appreciate here. you know your flexibility and you know now we can talk. Yes. All right. Let's 
do it. Let's do it. What I like to do is first I like to do a geographical check-in. So right now we're in like your home office in L.A. Mm -hmm. Tell us where you grew up. Grew up in Youngstown, Ohio, northeastern Ohio. Go Cavs, go Browns, <laughs> go Indians. Um, and the first time I lived outside of Ohio was when I uh, drove my little Honda Civic across country to Los Angeles. Los Angeles. What year was that? We don't sit. We don't. We, we don't, don't talk give those years? details. Okay. Okay. Well, I bet you it'll probably come up anyways, <laughs> though. But still, <laughs> fine. You went to John Carroll University. Mm -hmm. What was Cleveland. your major? I was uh, an accounting major for two and a half years, and then I switched over to marketing and logistics, so business major, Ooh. which I do think has helped me. Really? For sure. How so? Uh, running a biz running the business of DJing, running the business of representing other DJs, um, having just a business mind and you've got the creative genius inside of you and then you've got the the business genius inside of you and and one wins <laughs> depending <laughs> on what day it is but it's a beautiful it's a beautiful combination it is it is tell us how did you go from working at handles ice cream stand <laughs> to driving your car on what's the road 70 west do you take 70 west God, from Cleveland? you know what i knew somebody in uh, I made it into an eight-day trip, and I knew somebody okay. in like six different states. So I, I, I took my time coming okay. out here. So it wasn't a straight <laughs> shot. Uh, who know? I, I only remember climbing up. Um, you know what? There was there's a road in Colorado, I think, oh. that I was climbing up. It was snowing. I thought I was going to die. I had a stick shift. Um, that's that's the part that I remember of the driving experience. But okay. it was pretty amazing. Okay, so how do I how do I do that? Go from a ice cream scooper to moving out here um it, i wouldn't have guessed that i would have ended up in la we didn't travel a lot when i was growing up um some i had a couple friends that lived in san francisco my senior year i finally made it out to san fran and wanted to move there my grandparents who raised me since i was 14 reminded me that i was gonna have to start paying for my own car insurance, health insurance, and I thought, I can't afford San Francisco, so I stayed, I took a job in Cleveland, Ohio, and two different friends of mine, one that I worked with, uh, right before I was about to sign a lease with another friend, <laughs> said, you wanna be out west, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you signing this lease? I called a girlfriend who lived, who worked with me at that, whose father owned that ice cream shop okay, when okay. I was working in there at 14, <laughs> uh, shout out Lee Fisher and Handles. Um, I called her. She was living in L.A. I had never been to Los Angeles. And I said, how do you like it? She said, I love it. We have an open bedroom in our house. I took the weekend. I called her back. I said, I'm coming out. Give me a month to save up money. <laughs> I didn't tell my family. Ooh. I didn't tell my grandparents because I knew they would talk me out of it. And I knew I couldn't ask for a cent because I knew that that would also right. hang over my head. <laughs> so I worked two jobs, uh, made as much money as I could, told them about a week beforehand, and packed up and moved out. Okay. And I remember pulling out of the driveway and crying um, out of excitement, out of uh, fear and excitement of, of the unknown. I didn't have a job. Uh, I was leaving stability to try something new. Yeah. And I knew that I could always, you know, take a left turn at some point. You could. You could. Go ahead. Let me just say one more thing. <laughs> I missed my flight leaving San Francisco and I was visiting that senior year and I ended up in Vegas for eight hours and I went to the strip. That's when there weren't nice stores. There was only tourist traps and went to the mall and got a new outfit, a different outfit because it was so hot. And I just, re I remember having a conversation with somebody um, in Vegas and them saying, and I left that conversation thinking, why can't I live in Vegas for six months? Why can't I live in this city for six months? I, I had come out of college thinking I needed to get this level job and then grow to this level job. It was very structured, leaving business school in the Midwest. And that, was, that opened me up. Missing that flight, coming back, opened me up to um, the possibility of taking some chances and living in different places. And it just kind of went from there. Went from there. So if you were going to go back, I'll ask this question again later, but okay. specifically for giving yourself advice for you to make the move, like knowing what you know now, what kind of advice would you give yourself before you make this trip across country? I love how I did it. I, you know, <laughs> I, 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 um, I owned it. I didn't, I knew that if I asked for any money, then other people would have some control over my decision. Um, my uncle talked me into telling them, a week ahead of time instead of the day ahead. And uh, maybe I would tell my family a little sooner, but um, 
um, going going on your own dime, owning your freedom, um, trying not to rush it. Taking that eight day road trip across the country by myself was pretty magical. Um, and you know, maybe having some job opportunities lined up when you got here, because <laughs> after a month I didn't have a job yet, and I thought holy shit, if I have to go back to Ohio, a recent college graduate, an outgoing personality, a good degree, um, that's crazy. So, right. But I didn't want to take something in accounting or I didn't want one of the areas that I really didn't want to work in. So um, anyway. All right. Yeah. Then tell us how does Ed O'Neill and Fox <laughs> Broadcasting fit into the picture? Okay. Did some research. You dug over there, okay? <laughs> um, so, growing up in Youngstown, uh, is Ed O'Neill is from Youngstown, Ohio, and went to my high school and was friends with my dad and my uncle. And um, so, I did reach out to him after I moved out here, um, and we be, we you know have had many many di- dinners at good Italian restaurants over the years, and he ended up. Um, getting me an interview with Fox Broadcasting and I got the job there and that led to a year and a half. My boss was from Ohio. He was from Cincinnati, Ohio. It was crazy. It was a really good department. Um, But it wasn't what I wanted to do long term and so I took the leap again and left there. But that, you know, I I don't want people calling Ed and knocking on his door (laughs) but that that getting me that interview definitely helped break me into uh, into the Hollywood experience. All right, because before Ed was on Modern Family, he mm-hmm. was really big with Married with Children for all the young folks out there. Yes, listening. Married with Children. So, yes. That was Fox Broadcasting. Mm-hmm. What made you make the leap to the next spot you were at in terms of like the advertising? I, in show? my head, I wanted to do uh, events or PR. I was interviewing with Wolf Casteller and I was interviewing with CAA. Mm-hmm. And I had a second interview coming up with CA, and Wolf Casteller offered me the job, and I had to give them an answer. So I took it. I went there. I was an assistant to two different fierce women, um, and uh, ended up there for five years and learned and grew so much in that job and um, was surrounded by really strong females who were killing it in their careers and, and who taught me a lot. What were some of the lessons that you learned when you were there that you still apply, maybe the top three that you still apply to your work and business today? Um, We treated all of our clients like they were A-list. So, and asked for things as such. We maybe not, weren't gonna get, you know, at the height of Matthew Perry's career for Friends, what we could get him wasn't necessarily the same thing we could get the next person, but um, going above and beyond and putting in the extra work. And, you know, I remember I went skiing one weekend and one of my clients wanted tickets to Britney's, Britney Spears was our client and another male uh, actor was our client and he wanted tickets and my boss couldn't get a hold of me to get to organize this whole thing because I was skiing. <laughs> and she, no, you check your phone every hour. You take the extra step, you put the work in. So, you know, I think we're all um, trying to figure out how to balance work and life and. I just am kind of a hustler because you are of Wolf Casteller. Cool. I got to say, um, also growing up, and uh, I had a really strong grandmother who was bound and determined to make sure I was an independent young woman at a, at an early age. So uh, those two things I think have definitely helped me to create this career. Cool. And then we're gonna go to Woodstock, 1999. Yes. <laughs> Talk to us about what okay. happened to so inspire you to be like, I'm going back okay. home, I'm buying a pair of techniques. Tell us the story. So, um, I won tickets on K-Rock to go to Woodstock 99, <laughs> right? I was an assistant at Fox. It was like early on and I'm, you know, I'm taking out, off for three days because I'm gonna go out to Woodstock. I won tickets on a Beatles song that was playing. You had to be the 100 and, um, uh, K Rock is what? 107, uh, whatever <laughs> color you had to be. Um, I'm, I was about to say 105.9, but that's not it. Um, 106.7. So you had to be like the 106 caller, and we um, won flight, hotel, ticket, two tickets to the concert. My friend Alicia, came, who was from Ohio, who lived out here, came out with me. And you have two stages plus a small indie indoor. Uh, area, but two stages 
for 200, they say 250,000 people were there. Let's just say 200,000, okay? Just imagine the energy at each stage. That's what I really truly believe that because of Woodstock 99, that's, they learned something. The, to, get a, to get security to any location, to leave and go to the bathroom and find your friends again, wasn't happening when you have that many people at one stage. Um, that's why there's six stages at, at uh, you know, Coachella and you know, 60,000, 70,000 people. But I just remember band after band and the energy of the people. And f- whether it was The Roots to Lauryn Hill to um, uh, Bush to, uh, don't laugh, but Kid Rock and um, Limp Bizkit were... Uh-huh. Crazy. I mean, this is 1999. The energy, Willie Nelson. Like, I just watched a video from DMX from Woodstock 99 the other day that Jeff Jam just posted. It was just this intense energy, and I just was thinking, I wish I could play music. I wish I could play an instrument. I wish I could sing. Anyone who's followed me on Instagram knows how bad of a voice I have. <laughs> and uh, and. At night, they had this airline hangar and they had DJs in there. Moby was in there. And I look up and there's this girl DJing with her blonde ponytail. And I looked around and I'm like, everybody's happy and everybody's (laughs) dancing. Now everyone, plenty of people are on drugs, but people were just grooving. And that, this is a time where I was going out to the clubs four or five nights a week to hear hip hop music in LA. That's when AM, before he even became, he was probably doing spots for $100, $150, but I just remember watching his fingers and watching his transitions and bringing in just little nuggets of old cheesy songs but that you loved and just for long enough that like you felt that nostalgia and then you went on to the next. He was he was uh, my everything with music and, and I think suddenly it was like, maybe I should DJ. <laughs> and I came back, I talked to a friend who was DJing, he was more in the electronic scene. Um, he was like, this is what you would need to do. It was a big investment. I said, okay, Michelle, give yourself six months and see if you still wanna do this. And six months later, I did. I bought the turntables. The guy at Sam Ash who sold me the turntables, this guy who I was buying vinyl from, blah, blah, blah. All these people said that they would help me and all these guys flaked. Mm. It, when it, when all was said and done, and my I was working at that point, I started working myself. I was in PR then, was working my way up the PR route, and had a boyfriend. And my turntable started collecting dust. And then there's more of a story. That goes on. Well, you could keep <laughs> going on the story if you so, want. <laughs> so so it was, it was co- collecting dust, and I would you know practice a little bit here and there, but I really needed to get to know the basics. Matthew Perry, who was one of my clients, was hosting Shaquille O'Neal's Shaktacular event. I was organizing all the logistics, um, and this guy said, oh, we have Spinderella DJing. I said, oh, I have turntables, but I, you know, I'm just not on them enough. And he said, I'll introduce you. We get to the event, I'm working. He remembered, and he said, let's go. I'm gonna introduce you to Spinderella. I said, don't bother her, she's busy. He said, no, she's just, she's a, she's a sweetheart, come on. I say hi. We talk for a minute. And then she said, looked at me. So this is two. This is two thousand. Yeah. This is pre I, pre computer days. So everyone's oh, still yeah, on vinyl, vinyl these days, by the way. So just want to put that out there. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> she she said, "Wait, you have turntables at your house? Because this is two thousand. This was not the, the we didn't have an oversaturated <laughs> DJ market." And I said, "Yes, but blah, blah blah." And she said, "Here's my number. I just moved here from New York. Call me anytime." And I screamed my way down Wilshire Boulevard <laughs> driving home that day with my best friend on the phone. I was so excited and I stayed on her. And I, for a year, she, I would go over to her house like once a week, once every two weeks. And she just, she taught me the basics. She taught me how to represent myself. She taught, she's just, she's a, a little guardian angel of mine. And I owe her so much. And her daughter, Christy Ray, what up? Um, is now DJing and I've uh, been pitching her and doing some bookings for her because yeah it's all love nice that's a great story we have to hear the whole story (laughs) thank you (laughs) that takes us to kind of now but first do you remember the blonde girl with the ponytail that you saw what's that doing her DJing okay so I thought that was um, oh gosh uh, our what's her name we can look it up we have time wait hold on hold on (laughs) um I thought, DJ. shoot, I'm not going to find it. Um, 
We can always add her information later if I you can't remember. I can't think of her name. I thought it was DJ Rap, I believe. I thought it was DJ Rap. But I met DJ Rap years later, and I said, I got to tell you this story. And she said, I wasn't at Woodstock 99. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 but you were. <laughs> and um, she's like, no, but I don't think so. And, I, you know, I, I thought it was DJ Rap. I don't, know who I, I don't know who that woman was that inspired me. That's who I thought it was. Okay. Anyway, it, it, I don't, we'll never know. We'll find out. We'll do a little research. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I can do my research. I, so, I see. So we'll do a little research. All right, so then... Well, let's find out this. In your opinion, what's important for creative professionals such as yourself and myself to succeed in today's business environment? Creative professionals or creative professional DJs? Let's answer it both ways, maybe. So I, there are so many DJs now. I, I really did get started at a good time and got my foot firmly planted in the Hollywood event scene um, where on any given night, I knew the 10 DJs that would be working, uh, female or male, and it's just a different world now, but um, the question is, what business? Like, what is important for people like us, creative professionals, Mm -hmm. both in the creative industry and the DJ world, to succeed in today's kind of business environment? Well, learning your craft, I still think is important. I know there's ways to fake the funk, but I do think, being able to put a good set together technically, being able to read a crowd, and, um, and, and having fun behind the turntables is really important. Then there's the business side. So schmoozing and working your contacts and staying in people's he- minds um, when gigs come up and meeting new people and being out there and listening to other pe- DJ sets and, um, is always important social media, using this free marketing that we have that takes up so much time. (laughs) Um, And some people do it really well and some people don't do it so well. And, you know, it is, there's, there's, you want to own it. You don't want it to own you with social media. We can go, that could be a whole nother (laughs) podcast. But, um, uh, and just, I think, I really believe in your word is, your word is born. Your word is like so important and, and having um, people respect you and, and carrying yourself in this, in this job, uh, especially now that I'm booking other DJs. That's, that's gray area. Not many people have done that before. So, um, you know, people being able to trust me and me being really transparent, even having a hard conversation sometimes uh, has really helped me to, to grow um, and have gut checks and, you know, checking my ego, embracing compassion. There's time someone gets another gig and your ego is going to mess with you, but then let me give them love. Let me go that route. Let me like that photo that they did that gig that I, you know, um, and putting that energy out there. I think, uh, you know, not getting too stressed about it. I say to some of my DJs, like, let's not get too stressed it's all going to work out. Let's not get too stressed. You know, keeping positive energy around you and uh, so you keep your sanity and you attract yeah. that and you give other people that. Yeah. You're preaching. Can we get an amen on a Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> so a couple of things we want to unpack there. First of all, how did you get to the point where you're comfortable with kind of keeping your ego in check and not worried if you don't get the gigs? Because that can, that can take you down a vicious rabbit mm-hmm. hole. So how do you work your way to get comfortable with that? I think... A, I've had a really good career and I still do. I can't believe I'm still DJing. And and that's another conversation too that I think would be really interesting uh, for a podcast of, of what's the longevity of a DJ and uh, another conversation. <laughs> but um, I, the, my first answer has to be therapy. Okay. We have, I have focused a lot on compassion and um, in my life, trying to understand that everybody when they behave poorly is coming from their own trauma and their own triggers and not letting my ego lash out i'm not perfect i do do things i say i said some things last night i was like what did i did i maybe <laughs> but um trying to check myself and wanting goodness in the world you know 
Good. We live in a, a city that can be bullshit a lot. And we have a, compa- you know, just even starting, um, I started this project, DJs Who Brunch or Who Lunch, DJs Who Lunch, with all female DJs because I see myself as a big sister in the industry now. And I know how competitive it is because there's so many. And we don't all know each other. We hear each- about each other. We hear little things. There's gossip. There's this. And I'm like, okay, let's put personalities and behind this and get to know one another and vent and inspire and talk about what equipment we're using or what it's like working at this club or whatever it is and so every two to three months um we have lunch and we just uh connect good you might call it big sister i call it a clear leader but that's my term for it so definitely if you were going to describe or summarize yourself in 30 seconds based on michelle summer 2018 how would you summarize yourself if I was going to describe myself based on Michelle... Like where you are right, right now, now, 2018, summer 2018, in 30 seconds or less. Shit. <laughs> um, Michelle, two th- 2018, I just got off my holiday month, so <laughs> getting good. back into That's the self-care. grind. Also, kind of looking at what things in my life bring me the most stress and what things in my life... Stress is good. There's a good stress and there's a stress that like you just don't really want to do that and eliminating a little bit of that and choosing the things that bring me more happiness. Um, right now I'm I've been in LA for two weeks, so refocusing on my relationships here. I always kind of have to do that. The more you travel, the more you got to kind of check in and be like, I'm here, we can hang. Right. And um, and connecting to the LA nightlife scene um, while I'm here. And just, you know, being inspired and trying to inspire. We are living in some weird... I just watched Handmaid's Tale five days in a row. So I just want to put that 23 episodes. I want to put that out there. <laughs> Praise be might come out of my mouth. I don't know. So there, <laughs> but that was a weird road the last week. And I did the premiere and right. I was like really deep into it. Um, but <laughs> but I, I just, you know, I am inspired and I... I want to keep sharing i i think the more authentic we can be the more multi-dimensional we are and we share with others um the better the world is what that's, i don't know that, that's, that's michelle 2018 right now i'm a little tan too so yeah, that's nice that works work it <laughs> what inspires you what inspires me music inspires me hip-hop inspires me um vibing out djing with another dj going three for three you know back and forth oh what what do you got oh okay (laughs) this is what i you know that inspires me um elephants anti-captivity uh is another passion of mine and social justice i'm definitely um involved in speak out on marinate in try to educate myself on uh, those are like my passions. I'm inspired by people coming together, stronger together, uh, whether it's women, women and men, men, you know, I just think that um, working together and the more I see that and the more I see us, uh, you know, lifting each other up, I'm inspired. Yeah. And the world is changing. I mean, banning the ban on plastic straws and the snowball that's happening right now with that, I'm inspired, let me yeah. tell you. All right. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm not kidding. I walk around with my metal straws. You, you think I'm... No, I no. believe you. Uh-huh. Yeah. So you said hip-hop inspired you. I remember mm. the first time I saw you. It's at the dime. Mm. And I walk in. I said, okay, you know, there's a DJ. She's playing good music. Cool. And then you hit this string wait, of... Wait, was it... She's a white hip, female DJ. No, was, was there it, some of that? No, it wasn't any of that because you were already playing hip-hop. So I was like, okay, you know, you got it. But what really got me <laughs> is that you hit a string of from Biggie Smalls, to Big Daddy Kane, to Pete Rock and T.L. Smooth, to there was one more song, like how um, do you remember this? Oh, like, I remember it clearly. Was this? Yeah, this was like 2014, maybe. So like <laughs> a month. four years. I remember. Yeah. Okay. And then it was like some tribe, and then you yeah. ended it up with like like maybe it was like some cool modi or something. I was like, ooh, I just had to stop back and just pause because most people don't really know how to string those kind of songs together, and for you to do that, I was like. All right. Okay. Thank respect. You. Respect. So I remember that. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. So you say hip hop inspires you. I'm trying mm-hmm. to figure out when would you say was the turning point? When did you say, okay, I've jumped both feet in with the DJ career. It's working. I'm on my way. 
Well, you know, I remember when I left my job, and that was two. Uh, I bought turntables in two thousand. My first public gig was until two thousand two. It's not I'm buying Serato la- tomorrow <laughs> and playing next Friday or I'm playing gonna, like the, there was a process. I'm gonna ask you about to that to DJ. <laughs> okay, um, and then two years after that was when I finally left my job, and it was I wanted to go to. Um, to Sundance, I was asked to DJ in Sundance, and uh, I, I didn't have the time off. And if I went with a client, and the client needed me last minute, which often happens, and I had a gig, my client was going to be my because that was my main form of income. So that was my priority, uh, PR. And I and I did love it in many ways, but I felt grounded, mm-hmm. and I really wanted to go. So I, my boss and I went out to dinner, and I explained to her what was going on. They knew I was DJing on the side, but they knew that that was second priority, not first. And um, and she let me go to Sundance, and I gave them three more months of work, and then I I left, and I remember the day after I left, I cried because, oh shit, <laughs> now it's getting real. There's not a check showing up next week, um, uh, and I thought I was gonna have to get a part time job at Best Buy. It was gonna be Culver City, so no one would see me. Right? It was right it's down the street. Great. I could walk there. Um, but people started hiring me. All those people that wanted my clients over the years to come to their parties gave me a shot. And they're, you know, they didn't have that many options back then, but they gave me a shot. And it, and it worked, and it worked brilliantly. Um, the, and then there have been levels. There have been times where you know, I have limited myself, saying, I don't want to be a DJ at this age. I don't want to be, I'm, I'm only going to do this for two more years, probably. Uh, you know, whatever it has been, I limited myself. And then I get there and, Things are still good, you know, really good. And then Good Morning America came along, and that that I just I just remember. I mean, getting Toronto Film Festival with that was my first gig with InStyle. That was major. Thank you, Jason Newman and Kelly Austin. Um, getting that gig led to a long relationship with Time Inc. and doing the InStyle Golden Globe party has been major for me. Um, and you know, it started with a band, and then it was a band and a DJ, and there was a lot of, there was there was backlash. They that was the Golden Globes. That was supposed to stay classy in the band yeah. and stuff. And then it was just me, you know. So and it's it's like the party. Yeah. Um. So that and then getting to Good Morning America, and I think Good Morning America, uh, number one morning show. Uh, I I don't remember eleven million, twelve uh, viewers or something. A significant but, amount. There, it, I don't want to get emotion too emotional, but like the one, there was one person that saw that that meant the world to me, which was my grandma in Ohio, because she never saw me oh. actually DJ. Um, she saw pictures, she cut things out. Youngstown would have things in their newspaper. She'd send them, you know, she, but she never got to see me DJ until she watched me on Good Morning America. So that was. Um, that meant everything to me, and you know, I got to do that three or four times yeah. on DJ Fridays, and that was an amazing experience. Um, and going on the road with Yahoo and touring the West the West Coast with them in a tour bus. Um, shout out Ben Lyons, and and uh, you know, I'd, there's just been some really yeah dope experiences and it keeps happening i mean just the you know i my company launching nona entertainment three years ago and we just did a project with getty villa where i got to curate a group of uh djs i you know we came up with we got 10 djs 10 amazing diverse djs involved um to do this project with getty villa called getty villa remix um getting creative and and uh and getting to travel the world. I used to look and think, what is it like to be DJ AM? <laughs> you know, what, like, he's on planes traveling, like, t- out of the country, and he's doing all this cool stuff. What's that like? Yeah. And then pinching myself when I'm in those moments. I think, and, and there's this quote that I've been, uh, I, I, I'm gonna share it with you, that I literally sent out to two people last week, and I it, it just hit me in the gut really hard. Um, and I think we all need to be reminded of this. Here, here you go. Here, here a little inspiration on a set, right. on a set, or this will be on a Sunday. <laughs> Perfect. Remember, remember, this is now and now and now. Live it, feel it, cling to it. I want to become acutely aware of all I've taken for granted. And for me, you know, 
posting how much I miss my being in Spain three weeks ago or posting, you know, about how excited I am about that gig in two weeks or, or on Friday. What about right now? Breathe this in, this moment. Like, this, like I get high off of that sometimes. <laughs> you know, if you really think, like, this is dope right now. This is dope. Stop <laughs> going to those other places and just try to really be present right now. So I just remember being on planes or being in, being playing on the beach in Barcelona and this, this, this is what I like. Thought that was so dope about AM, and, yeah. and look, I mean, listen, AM was on another level, but like, we've all. I was just, I was inspired. Yeah. Anyway, and what I was mean, the question? You, <laughs> <laughs> you started like, we'll say, eighteen, seventeen, eighteen years ago. So it's not. I mean, it's you put in your, you paid your dues, you put in your work, but now even more things are happening. And as a follow-up question, when you talked to your grandma after Good Morning America, what was that conversation? What did she say to you? If you can share and not get too... God, I don't remember. Um, I, uh, I remember she was living in assisted living at that point, And I, I mean, she was so excited. I just remember some of the ladies who worked there when I went in telling me how excited she was. Hearing third person, how, you know, from third person, how, um, how excited she was and how she was telling everybody my grandma wasn't a boaster she was she's not even that social but like having her tell other people about michelle's gonna be on good morning america michelle's on good morning america you know sharing it um just knowing how proud she was of me yeah was was uh i mean that was everything yeah so so what's your opinion on the large influx of djs that are in our world now I'm old school, you know? I mean, I even, <laughs> I just put Serato DJ on my computer two days ago. Last night was my first gig on Serato DJ, the, so big ups. The upgrade. Big, big, <laughs> the upgrade that <laughs> no they more tried to force me to do for three years now. <laughs> no more scratch live. Because if it isn't broke, to, yeah, every time I get a new computer, I got to put the old operating system in so I can stand scratch live. Um, you know, I don't want a day where turntables are a niche night. Oh, turntable night, Fridays. No, 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 no. So... I do think there there is equipment and I, I want to up my game. This is something I need to work on too. And like I have an S9 sitting in there right now that um, I borrowed to mess around on it and to see if I should buy one because things change so fast these days. <laughs> but um, I think there are really creative people. There are creative DJs. There were when I started and there are now that are in their basement probably not making 100 bucks a week off of, off of doing this, if anything. And... That's sad to me, but there's more to DJing than just the technical part, you know? Mm -hmm. yes. um, and then there are DJ, there are people that call themselves, put, the, put the, the two letters DJ in front of their name, and they haven't put anything into mixing, blending. If I hear somebody say, I have really good taste in music, that's great. Music curator for the evening. That's cool. <laughs> like, let's not say DJ. I'm, I, you know, I, I got love for anybody that wants to get in it. It's an oversaturated market. I, it's not easy now, but I also think like put your mixtapes together. Put you need to have a sample of what you can do in a party live, not all edited on your computer, <laughs> um, and you need to to read a room. I I think it's a hard. It's hard to stand out now. I mean, we used to be in People Magazine, Us Weekly, listed in all these magazines quite often. And then, then it just, you know, it wasn't the new new anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, listen, this kid, Buck Rogers, I played with at Old Dirty Sundays in Tampa. He's from Austin, Texas. And he's on, you know, this equipment, I don't even know the names of things, the pad, and he's doing all this stuff. He's also on turntables, though, and this, and he's making new music out of the songs on equipment that I don't know how to touch. Um, I think that's dope. I've gotten into conversations with DJ Hoppa about the controller. I am not a fan of a controller. I think it's, unless it's, you're on the beach and the wind and the sand are blowing and you have no other options, I'm not really into that. And I think DJs should keep, keep turntables alive or C, you know, CDJs, I guess. But I, um, the exact question that you want me to answer. <laughs> You've talked through it all yeah. as well. It's just like with the influx of so many yeah. DJs out there, you can then we can continue. 
What advice would you Keep give to someone? Keep creativity going. You know what? If you it, you could be on a control, you could be in internal mode and get up there and create something dope, and my jaw would drop, and I'd have to say I was wrong. That's the truth. But from what I've seen, I just think there's too much of I'm going to be a DJ tomorrow and play on Friday, and there's too many. Sh- there's so many shortcuts now to DJing. I mean, when you make your mixes, make sure you put your name all over that because someone will steal that mix and play it at a party. Yes. Um, I just, like, I, I don't want to see people fake in the funk. If you put DJ in front of your name and you're not really putting the work in to be a good DJ, then you are watering down the industry. And, and, and that, that, I think, is the problem, and I hope people take that to heart. Um, but, you know... We all have room to improve, um, and I hope everyone keeps turntables alive. That's my thing. We'll make that happen. PSA. We'll we'll, we'll keep that that movement going along. What is something that scares you? In anything. Life. Yes, life. (laughs) Gosh. Okay, so death still scares me. I'm not there yet. Um, Gilead scares me. Handmaid's Tale. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, what's something that has stressed me out and there's fear of what's next in my career? That's always scared me from when I was in a long relationship with my boyfriend's, my ex-boyfriend's dad used to ask me what I was going to do next because he, you know, he didn't get how, where this could go. And that always kind of, that always scared me. I'm still scared of it. I think I'm going to be poor one day and, you know, I, you know, you may, DJs make good money, most DJs. And um, and the other thing that scares me is feeling trapped. And that's probably why I'm on the move so much. I've had, I, I live my life with a lot of freedom. When you're your own boss, when you pay your own bills. Um, I, I do have people I work for every week and I've got to, you know, be a little bit of a chameleon at times and, and respect that relationship, but I always say to young women, be your own boss, pay your own bills. The amount of freedom that brings you is amazing. And I, I always have a fear of being trapped. I can get on a plane and go anywhere I want tomorrow. That's an amazing feeling for someone who didn't take summer vacations growing up. Like we, we you know, we were, we were in Ohio kicking it in our pool <laughs> above ground with the go karts, and I loved it. I didn't know anything else, and I love that. That's beautiful, but. You know, there's. I've just. I've gotten high off of um, of, of traveling the world, which is gonna. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah <laughs> go for it. <laughs> what do you do to work on kind of lessening your feeling or your fear of being trapped? How do you work on that? <laughs> don't let anyone trap me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Besides <Emphasize> that. <laughs> Probably why I don't have kids yet. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um. I. It, you know. Uh. What do I? How do I work on lessening my fear of being trapped? keep hustling (laughs) keep keep evolving um you know that fear of being trapped or or not knowing what i'm going to do next and and the the when i started i told myself that there wasn't a goal enjoy the journey and see what doors open up along the way little you know 18 years ago 14 years ago when i was leaving my job that's what i told myself and I wish I had a bit of better memory to remember all the doors that have opened up along the way. Because there have been a lot. I need to be writing the, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, just kind of seeing how I evolve and, and this elephant, the last seven years with the elephants and anti-captivity has really uh, taken me down certain paths and um, yeah, I go to elephant conferences. I mean, I'm, you know. You're more than just a DJ. And <laughs> I think than just that's... That's very clear. It'll become clear throughout our conversation, but that's something that you know I admire in you is that you do more than just DJ parties. You do more than just uh, train and kind of bring through the next generation of DJs, and I think that's important, so I want you to keep doing that. That's my point. Thank you. But yeah, you know, so it's like, you know the saying is, what you do is not who you are, and I think you exemplify that, so continue. Thank you. You're welcome. Now... How has a failure or an apparent failure set you up for later success? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? You know what? People talk about their failures and how good that ended up being for them. And I try to think about this and I'm like, I don't know. I, I, so often I'm like, 
I, I, maybe I just don't see things that are failures as failures. The one thing that does stand out, though, <laughs> I'm going to share this. I, had, I, You know, I follow Super Soul Sunday, and I like Oprah, and uh, yeah, it's cliche, but I do. And um, I had some email from Oprah dot com whatever the email was and we it was a busy week so i was just opening the 911s and the and the business things and i wasn't opening the spam or the weekly inspirational oprah.com email well that wasn't an inspirational oprah.com email that was an email to dj for oprah like the following week or something for their holiday par- it was something last minute and they got my name and they wanted me to dj and oprah was uh, I missed it. I missed the opportunity. We didn't open it till three days later when I had my assistant going through and catching up on all the emails that weren't urgent mm. ones, and I missed it. And that, mm. my friend, stands out. <laughs> that, enough said there. Yes, Oprah. So we're going to have to get in contact with Oprah. Who, you know. Oh, I still email them. <laughs> <laughs> it will happen. Patience is a virtue, it which is. I don't have a lot of, but, but patience is a beautiful thing. Yeah. <laughs> How do you handle your critics? Because as you become mm. more popular, more successful, people see you on the red carpets at all the awards show, yeah. not just with DJs, but people in general, like, you know, who is she? How do you handle your critics? You know, some people are just like social on social media. I remember being on that Yahoo on the road tour and people were tweeting at me and some like some guy was out for me, you know. I, I don't even remember what he was saying. This was so long ago. But I was like, wow, the bigger audience you get, the more you're going to get, mm-hmm. you know, people like to tear you down. Um, I literally will visualize when, when, when something gets to me deep or I have like a high stress about something or I will visualize that energy going and feeding the fire. I will literally visualize a fire under my butt and I will send that into the fire to just work harder, you know? And and sometimes people have a point. Sometimes my set wasn't on point or this or this this mix to this, you know, this song to this song wasn't on point or you know, or, or people are going to get upset. Um you know, and when you're in a set and people are like they want this person wants more hip hop, this person wants more rock. This person, you know, you got to get out of that. You got to stop because that will throw you off. Um, <laughs> but when that's not what we're talking about right now. We're talking <laughs> You know, just kind of taking it and, and 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 sending it into that fire that just exists under my butt. I literally visualize that. Good. That's, That's a- when I get stressed too, like uh, you know about gigs or bookings or whatever. I, that's where it, that's I do that. Okay. That's an interesting visual. We'll keep mm-hmm. that in mind. <laughs> Tell us about the darkest time in your life, how you got through that, and what did you learn from that experience? It's a real interesting question. Um you know, I, I don't know when, I, I can't sit here and say that was, the, you know what, my parents died when I was young, at those eight, two and a half and 14, I didn't think that was like the darkest time of my life. Um, you look back and you think, you see the scars in your life from that, and you know that that's affected you. Um, but I guess, you're gonna try to make me cry. Uh, I guess, uh, <laughs> three years ago when my grandma died Mm. and my cat died (laughs) and i know that sounds crazy right saying your cat and your grandma uh affecting you so deeply in the same sentence but mama sita was like my little soul sister and that was my cat and my grandma (laughs) um was my everything she raised me she lived uh, she lived one street over my whole life um until she raised me at 14 and and um, she just died. So I, that was a day I dreaded my whole life. And then, you know, it happened. So I think, so was, there it goes. Um, so I think that was probably like the months after that were probably like the hardest for me. Yeah. I still miss both of them weekly, if not daily, yeah. um, and feel their energy. For sure. So in that instance, like you still have a business to run. You still have to work. You have to do gigs. How did I you? I had the Golden Globes that weekend. The weekend my grandma died. How did you manage? Um, I, so she uh, got really sick again in November. I was going home to Ohio probably every two weeks because I just needed her to know I was there. And then I, I wanted no regrets. 
You know, mm-hmm. when you lose your parents young, there's regrets. There's, I was in a, you know, I was a 14 year old smart ass when my dad died. We were arguing, you know, and um, I didn't want any regrets. I, she, I was very expressive with my grandma. We were really tight. I tried to be really pretty honest with her because I wanted realness. I didn't want to always tell her everything was good and fine. Hi, Graham. And <laughs> I wanted deep connection with her. And so um, I was going home a lot. Then award season starts with the Globes. And she died. I swear, I think it was like the Friday in the, my weekends. My Globes weekend starts Friday. Um, I had them... She was she uh, was getting cremated. That was mm-hmm. her choice. Yes. So I had them hold her body um, till Tuesday, so I could get home Monday night and see you know go see her mm-hmm. and spend some time uh, with her. So so what was the question? Sorry. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> this is your darkest time. Um, You're talking through yeah, it. So yeah. So so oh, how do I go? You know. Yeah. Focus. You just got to focus. I remember I had a gig the day Mamacita got hit by a car, my, my cat. And that was my grandma. I, was, I had a few months. I, was, I knew it was happening. I even was able to say, it's okay to let go, you know, to her. Mamacita was like sudden, didn't expect it, wasn't an old cat. And um, I had a gig the next day. And, and uh, what is his name? Um, uh, the performer that... Avicii did a song with um, Hello Black Hello Black was performing at this event uh, acoustic and it was just really beautiful I I saw a video from it and I was you know that I was hit at that moment had to get through that weekend uh, those gigs too but um, but that was a moment yeah so you know I just my grandma wants me to be a tough cookie I know that so there's no that's what she wants yeah um. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're a tough cookie. I think you're doing a proud. <laughs> no worries. No worries. So it's obvious that your grandma had a lot of influence on you growing up. Mm-hmm. You spoke about maybe talk to us about DJ M and how he influenced your DJ career and kind of got you to make your own style. You know, I just when we were gonna go out and dance, it was where's AM playing, you know? And this was like pre Banana Split Days. This is when he was. It was hip hop. It was throwing a little rock in there and throwing a little cheesy old school in there. And um, I think, I mean, my love of hip hop started when I was a kid. I remember having the too short tape left in my car and I remember <laughs> having Tupac left in my, I mean, you know, cause we're in next on Ohio. We weren't, Bones, I definitely wasn't listening territory. to Gangstar. I don't think back then that was like later on, but, um, but I think I'm influenced by AM because I mean he just rocked a party and throwing little nuggets of I, I'll throw Tiffany in I'll throw Sophie B Hawkins in I'll throw you know like things that just make me light up um little nuggets of them not too much <laughs> <laughs> but you know if I could only scratch like AM I mean I whew. Yeah. I just I was obsessed with watching his hands. Good. Yeah. Yeah. There's always ways to improve and get better yes, if you want. Yeah, of course. So. I've got a I've got a list of things to do. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what do you find easy to do that your friends find hard to do? What do I uh, mix two songs together? <laughs> I don't think my friends would know what to do. Uh, most of them. Um, what do I find easy to do? Uh <laughs> Make it to five places in one night. Mm. I mean, they, I overbook. I think I can do it. I'll figure it out. I'll make it to all. I'll probably be late to the first, but I'll be the last one to go home. Um, you know, I, I will bop around from place to place and try. I try to show up. I try to show up, even if it's not for the full event. Yeah. I, I show up. Yeah. Um, so probably just the energy to like keep going. And, and you give me some good hip hop. And whiskey Red Bull, and I'm good. <laughs> You're good. With a yeah. metal straw. Yeah. You do show up, so keep showing up. That's good. That's a good character trait, because many people don't show up. They're mm-hmm. on their own world, so that's good. We're going to go back to 21-year-old Michelle. I think she's in Cleveland. Yep. And we're going to have a conversation with her. If you could give 21-year-old Michelle advice based on what you know now, what would you say? I got you. I got you, girl. <laughs> um, 
Um, enjoy the ride. Um, I, I just, you know, I mean, I, I figured it out. I, there's a couple things that maybe I would change in the, since, since then, but not too, too much. Um, keep working hard. Keep loving yourself. Mm-hmm. Fill up your own cup. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what's coming to mind. These are great things. Keep sharing. Try to live sharing. in the now. Yeah. Yeah. What is one lesson in life that took you the longest to learn? Probably a lesson that I haven't learned yet. <laughs> <laughs> what would that be? What's, what's, what do you still need to learn? I, you know, I like. Do I want kids? Do I want you know, like the you know, kind of making that happen? Like any human being, you've, some days you want this, and some days you want that, and and it's fluid. And and I love my freedom, but I also love the idea of family and and trying to figure that out and and um, feeling some time pressure on that. I think. Um, that I'm still learning that and and you know really take I think that I've le- I've become better at saying what do you want that outcome to be of this specific situation make sure you're acting in a way that's going to get you to that cuz some I'm I am Italian and I am I am passionate and I <laughs> I'll react you know sometimes but like is that going to get you to that and and kind of like thinking through it for for a minute okay yeah good you started your DJ career and you were quoting, let's say, one rate. Now you can quote a significantly higher rate. What have you done throughout the whole process to maintain your self-worth so that you're getting what you're worth when you're playing out and getting? Because that's a common concern for maybe people who are a little bit younger in their career. So I'm curious to hear your advice about that. About how you quote? Like quoting your, pricing and mm-hmm. sticking to your self-worth. That's really a hot topic yeah. out here. So I was raising my rate. I still do hourly rates. Mm-hmm. I still, I'm, I just think if you work two hours, which is so much easier than working a four hour gig or even a three hour gig to me, like two hours, you know? Um, so I still do hourly. Most people don't. I was upping my rate when, um, when I was getting more press. So as more press came out, I would look to see how much, maybe once or twice a year, and I would increase my rate, maybe at the end of the year or middle and end. That was, that was kind of how I was uh, getting my rate to increase over over all these years. And then when I remember when the market crashed and uh, sorry, it crashed in '09, yes. you know, people didn't have that. Suddenly, there was a a freeze on parties, and if they did do a party, like the budgets were slashed. And working with clients. But a lot of my clients don't have my rate, and I think always flexible. I think being smart about things that are maybe either A, good for your career, mm-hmm. or B, good for your soul. I spend at the Dime, I've been spending at the Dime for 14 years. The Dime fits about 60 people. It's a little bar. <laughs> I don't wanna call it a hole in the wall, because it's not, but right. it is, but it's not. <laughs> and I love that place. We're only there once a month now. I don't have to promote every week. It's I play with Tendaji. That's my par- that's my partner, and I get to play hip hop that I love. So it's not about the money, um, you know. And and being okay to say no. If you're not gonna, you you can't really barter. You can't really negotiate if you're not willing to walk away too. You know and and. I, Sometimes I do, and now I've got other DJs that I can pitch to, and maybe someone's comfortable with that rate, you know, um, or or really wants that jo- that gig that to be associated with that brand or or that celebrity or whatever it is. But um, and there's a, there's also other ways to sweeten a deal. So and I think a lot of people that that book that are booking the like that want the DJ, the actual client of the brand, you know, the brand or the party producer whatever it is they need to know that just because i say this is my rate and i'll say it's negotiable always negotiable they're still scared to come back and and disrespect you with Mm. such a lower rate but it's still good money like come on and i'll say 
can you, is there press? Can you put my name on the invite? Can you put my logo on the step and repeat? You know, mm. there's other things that you yes. can do to sweeten this deal. So don't walk away if you really want this DJ or if you think that this DJ is going to be perfect for you. Like, you know, there's other ways to, to try to work it out. And I think the DJ can bring that up too. Good. For sure. Agreed. Yeah. My little secrets. That's good. Good answers. Good <laughs> tips. We're like going to class. This is like part of the master class. Every great person has a sentence. What is your sentence? For example, my sentence would be, I help people unlock their creativity by teaching them how to DJ. What is your sentence? Okay. I like that. Thank you. Um, you know, my sentence has become, over many years, and I find myself saying it, open yourself up to the world and the world will open up to you. And I really, I have lived that. I, um, well, it's been about eight years now I started traveling internationally more. I got out of an eight-year relationship and I just kind of took off. And I remember the moment that I was like, I need to let go of this L.A. Uh, exclusiveness or too cool for, for this or whateverness <laughs> and be in the moment. And I did that. And it really, you know, it opened up so many parts of myself and led me down so many roads and it connected me with so many people all across the globe. And, you know, I do, I go places by myself. I meet up with friends at certain points. At certain points, I'm alone in countries that people would never really even, you know, think to do that. And it's really given me some of the most amazing experiences. I've DJed in some of the most amazing places. I mean, I'll go, I'll go to Barcelona and I'll have zero gigs booked and I land and this DJ is like, oh, on Tuesday, you want to come spend with me here and blah, blah. And it's not about the money. Yes. Um, it's the experience. And, and then it's me playing 90s hip hop that I love so much and them knowing every word and I'm in the <laughs> middle of Spain. What? Um, Lovely. But open up, and, and it's more than just DJing. It's it, really uh, open yourself up to the world, and the world will open up to you. Love it. Great sentence. What is one new habit that you've added to your daily routine in the past year or so that has been most beneficial? Hmm. <laughs> well, I am not very structured at all. Um, uh, making, um, making a. Uh, Protein shakes, but it's I've fallen off. Getting to the gym and stretching, probably. Mm -hmm. I had a trainer that used to come here, which was great, but I'm really liking going to the gym, too. I walk to the gym 25 minutes, walk home 25 minutes, and take a class. That's been a really good thing. I tried to get on this meditation apps. I haven't been on it for like a month. I, <laughs> I'm not very structured. <laughs> I mean, or you know... But those I'd are like good to say habits. flossing every day. That's still not on point. <laughs> you got to work on the flossing. We need your teeth. Every day flossing. Yes. yes. <laughs> My grandma told me. Um, you know, there's so many things I, I want to be doing every day or every other day. Downloading music every other day. Mm -hmm. um, yes. There's so much music yes. coming out like and quickly. staying on top of it. Yes. And, and this album gets heat and fire. And is anyone talking about it next Tuesday? It's no, crazy, right? I know. It's, Wait, it's, that's, that's interesting. That's uh, crazy like whew. we're overstimulated yeah yeah how do we manage how do we manage i don't know well, <laughs> let's talk about some are people bored yet <laughs> no 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 they're definitely not bored let's talk about some books is there one or more book <laughs> that you feel people should stop what they're doing right now uh -huh. and read it right away she's walking to get some books to show us i love this okay. we're gonna get show and tell show you. yes oh we got a stack of books you know i love books too let's see what we got here Guys, All these right. are my books that I was trying to read as I was traveling and going to sit at the beach and, 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 and or sit at wherever I was traveling to and pull out a book, right? <laughs> my friend wrote a book. Shout out John, Johnny Kovach, 59 Hours. We got Eckhart Tolle, Girl Boss, The Road Less Traveled, The Tipping Point. Okay. This, is, this has been read. I mean, this is, I, this is, I'm still reading. I've had these for years. These were given to me or recently bought okay yeah i'm not reading them i um am not a great book reader when i think about it i love the idea of it i highlight i love to have a highlighter or a pen with me and i start i start marking things right <laughs> the alchemist and 50 shades of gray is probably the only things i've finished in the past 10 years That's like all the opposite is let spectrum. me tell you hate on 50 shades of gray all you want but like 
that puts you in some sort of mood. And I was on planes hiding that I was watching because I was like, my temperature was going up. I mean, okay. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> That's a good I got question. music to work on. I got to organize my iTunes. <laughs> yeah. When I start reading books, I think about my iTunes and how I need to get organized and put things in crates and download new music. And so, you know, I... I <laughs> A magazine is about as much as I'm trying. I haven't even gotten through the Serena Williams in style. article in the badass issue of InStyle magazine out this month yet. Yeah, but yeah. that's what I'm excited about the badass issue. Um, so, yeah. That works. That answers you know, the question. It, it, it needs to get better. <laughs> it's on my list of things. But honestly, me, I've got to organize music and go through yeah. music and listen to music and in my itunes so that takes priority understood we can give you a few recommendations to get you Ch off and running trying to get more into podcasts because i think you oh. can get really inspired and um what podcast do you listen to now let's pull out my <laughs> podcast list. you're so hilarious this is show and tell i love it i mean what, what do i have what do i follow okay where, where do we go for this part <laughs> there we go okay i have this is what i have Kind of neat. I don't know what that is. Startup Podcast, Girl Boss Radio, Star Talk Radio, Pod Save America. That's a popular one, right? Someone, yes. Yeah. Freakonomics Radio. Yeah, that's a popular one. Four DJs. I don't know what that is. I don't think that's... Anyway, those are the ones that I've followed. We got Where can some... you see what you've actually played? I don't know. We've got some recommendations for yeah. you. Yeah. I, I need... We'll hook you up. Recently added? Is that what... Yeah, yeah. It's I don't okay. Know. We'll hook you up. Don't you worry. <laughs> we got some open. good ones for you to listen to. I have a couple in mind that I'll share with you that are good. Okay. I'm 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 down with okay. it. I like ins inspiring things. Like I'm I'm like a super soul Sundayer. Yeah. You know that's yeah. on my D my DVR is a little bit crazy too. You know that's a podcast too, right? So when you're driving around your car, you can listen to it. Of course it is. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, we're gonna add I that try one. I go TED Talks. I do listen to. Good. Yeah, I think there there's a few others there's you so like. Many. Tim Ferriss show you like. Debbie Million. I know Tim Man. Ferriss, yeah. and I'm a big fan of Brene Brown. Yeah. Um, and Esther. Esther, Esther Perel, Perel, Perel. Perel, the Perel. love doctor. Yes. She was yes. at Summit, and I took a one hour course. The depth that she got with men and, you know, men and women, in one hour at Summit in November was. Mm -hmm. Uh, inspiring and I want to go to a three day workshop with her yes. talking to men and women and getting yes. us to communicate about it but that's another conversation she has a podcast too that's yep. good okay uh, I got a couple for you Kay. definitely um, cool tell us first what made you what motivated you to start Nona Entertainment and mm -hmm. kind of talk to us about how it's going so far okay so I was um, I always represented myself uh, I do the gr I did the Grammy, the official Grammy after party, six years in a row, seven years. Where was I at? I did it um, every, you know, the last six years in LA. Last year was in New York, so they had a New York DJ, all love, and um, we'll see. It comes back to LA this year uh, or next year, and I. After that, after one of my performances, I remember like three different people approached me. It's a really big day for me. And three different people approached me about representing me and I ended up, I was gonna go with this one company. This is an interesting story. I was gonna go with this one company. And you know, I've been do at that point I had been doing all my own work for so long. And I, uh, men were running this company. I was like, okay, this will be great. The night before my meeting with them, I was watching 60 Minutes and Sheryl Sandberg's on. Um, that was the whole lean in. Uh, promotional tour and I thought why am I going to go and hand over all the contacts that I've worked so hard to maintain over these years this is crazy and some of my clients are going to be like wait who do I need to talk to now but I was like this is crazy I'm going to go in there and I'm going to say great you guys can represent me but I also want to head up your private events division I want to book for you guys um, and be the head booker in, in the private events. So that's what I did. They loved the idea. We went through contract negotiations. We were so close. And there was one term that they said, I, we know we said we would do this, but we can't. Like financially, that wouldn't work. And so then I just sat on it. We didn't do anything. And then they folded like three months later, mm -hmm. that company. And I, in my head, people had said, start your own company why don't you start your own company blah blah because i was passing gigs to people sometimes to friends and um 
and also wanting to diversify my basket because that's how you should be living in 2000 whatever now um and so i went uh i in my head though i was like i need to work for a company for like a year and see how they do it i believe in corporation i believe that the world is still run by corporations I know a lot of us freelance, we live in a city that, you know, we're in an industry, but I do think that businesses, uh, the business world and how things are run are still on a corporate level first. And I thought I should go in house. Um, and the more I sat on that, the more I thought, Michelle, you've been doing this for yourself for so long. So maybe you don't have all the language or maybe you don't have all the answers or maybe you don't have all the contracts you need, blah, blah. But you'll ask questions to people you need to ask to and you'll figure it out and you've been doing it your way. And that's cool. And so I decided to open Nona, which is grandma in Italian, but I just dropped one of the ends. Love it. And, um, and Alex Morrell was uh, a DJ in New York, is a DJ in New York. And, and I went to her first and I said, um, you know, I'm thinking of starting this. We weren't t- super tight. We did a gig together and I just, I thought she was, I liked her vibe. She's in New York. She's on the, you know, I just knew that there were opportunities. And, um, so I started Nona with the two of us and I quickly made some decisions on I DJing is still my number one priority I don't want to bite off more than I can chew and I am not a fan of management companies or booking companies or whatever you want to call them saying all my DJs are open format here's my six DJs who do you want let's see what sticks to the wall I think that um, you know Tendaji plays soul and Motown much better than Ryan plays like indie rock and much better than Daisy plays like disco. And I just, when you play from your heart, we can all do 90s hip hop and we can all probably do all those genres I just said. But when you play from your heart, you put in a better set. That's Mm -hmm. the truth. Mm -hmm. So if I can, if if those DJs are available and I can, you know, get them in there, I want to offer the best options to my clients. And my clients trust me and trust how I'm not normally a type personality but when it comes to music and vibe and the details of a party I really do get there I mean I will turn speakers I will talk about the lighting I you know I am not really a stay in your lane but I feel like part of my lane as a DJ is also the whole vibe of it you know and you know which clients you can speak up on and they right. a lot of them appreciate it immensely um so I decided to book most of my DJs non-exclusively. So I have non-exclusive contracts with 15 DJs that I've known over the years. Trust me, trust my word. Because you're pitching. Sometimes I'm pitching myself and I'm usually, uh, often I am on the higher end. I'm, you know, you're pitching yourself along with others so you, and you want to be fair and you want to be right and you, wanna, you want people to be able to believe in, in your honesty. And... Uh, but I, I do it mostly non-exclusively, non-exclusively so that I'm not biting off too much. I don't have to make sure I'm feeding seven people at the mm-hmm. every, end of every month. And I can really focus on who is best for that. And I give my client two or three options knowing what these DJs sound like. And that's, that's really how Nona started and where my head's been at. It's been a hard road. I mean, I, I, I launched it and left for Africa the next day. Um, <laughs> Wi-Fi? <laughs> Oops, yeah. No, no, no. There, here's a story. I'm in. I'm. I'm on safari in Kenya, and I've got emails to do. But we're out all day in safari. We get back. I want to eat with the people that I'm with, you know, because it's kind of rude not to. And so then I'm right after dinner. I'm in the lobby because that's only where, where you yes. get the um, Wi-Fi on their little modem. And I'm on there, and the Wi-Fi, they turn it off at night. So, like, <laughs> once it gets to, like, 11 or whatever the time was, they're going to turn it off. So I'm typing away, typing away, typing away, right, because I have all this work to do. And suddenly, the, I, I know the guy's, like, he wants to leave. He's there because I'm there. And he, like, let it go 10 minutes past, and then he just turned it off. <laughs> and I was like, um, can you just, just turn it on for a few more minutes, a few more, and he just acts like he doesn't, doesn't know what I'm saying. I have bugs hitting my computer screen because it's the only light in the entire room because everything's dark and I'm just I'm just typing like this not typing any emails because I don't have any Wi-Fi I'm just like I'm just out of spite (laughs) right now because I want a little bit more power like that was yeah that was brilliant to to launch and then leave for Africa but it's been a road I've learned a lot um you know I often envy the DJ that has the team around them that doesn't have to think so hard about the bookings, the publicity, the 
uh, social media, although I think everyone kind of has mm-hmm. has their hands somewhat on it, even if they have somebody else helping them. Um, the styling, the it's there's a lot that goes into this, um, and I am involved in mine, and I'm involved in other people's too. And so, uh, there's times where I just want to be the artist or want to be without, you know, that stress or the, that workload, but. I chose this path yeah. and I'm just learning how to bring in more of what I do love and what I'm good at and then building a team around you that can help you with those stuff that you don't like doing or that you're not good at. Okay. I, I think building a team, building your team is hard. Finding good people that are, you know, to, to be on that team is hard. Um, and that's, that's one of the biggest challenges I'm working on right now is really having my team in place and, and people I can go to for uh, whatever the needs are. Yeah. I'm hiring. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that too. We'll see what you're hiring for. Okay. Um, as we kind of come to a close of the interview, a couple more questions. First of all, we'll do a fun question first and then another serious one. If you're coming up to bat and you're playing for the Cleveland Indians, you know, <laughs> batting clean up, yeah. and they're playing a song to announce you, what song is on as you walk up to bat? So I knew this question was coming. <laughs> I played it right before my interview to get me pumped up. Um, KRS One Rapture. It was, it, it, I don't even know that that's, when people ask you what's your favorite song, I don't know what my favorite song is, but that's one of my top hip hop songs. And I remember I used to ask AM to play that song, like every gig I saw him at for probably eight months. And when I became a DJ, I, I realized how fucking annoying I must have been. And like <laughs> 70% of the time he would play that in his set for me, he, you know, which was so lovely of him but god did i really do that <laughs> yeah I you did, did. i did yes. <laughs> um but yeah that would be that would be my song good good selection now if there's some young kind of up-and-coming djs that i may have just gotten their start and then listen to this interview what advice would you give them if they wanted to follow in your footsteps and they want to go and do the grammy parties and the oscar parties once you've mm-hmm. retired we'll keep mm-hmm. we'll keep them until you retire <laughs> but what advice would you give them so when I when people ask me, I mean, I'm always like, A, use your real name. If I would have used DJ Smurfette, these were the options. <laughs> Smurfette, because she was one of the only girls with all the guys. I was like one of the only hip hop female DJs, you know. DJ Smurfette, uh, Peppermint Patty, because I look so much like her. Coup d'etat, my friend was obsessed with me being called Coup d'etat. I would like, do you think that um, InStyle wants to put that on their invite? <laughs> no. Do you, and just branding myself for so many years as being a DJ, a musical curator, a businesswoman, because I use my, my name, um, you know, I'm amazed sometimes. People are like, oh, I, I know you, I know your name, I, you know, but I think using your real name is brilliant. Uh, I always say, buy turntables or CDJs. Yes, agree. Uh, yes. Um, be patient. Just okay. keep at it. That's hard. Keep at it. Keep at your craft. Make sure you're not a train wreck on the tur- on the whatever equipment you're using. Figuratively and literally. And and reading a crowd. You know, when I started, I had a notebook, and I was playing at this. Uh, I was playing at Deluxe uh, at uh, Las Palmas. It was called a bar called Deluxe. Every Thursday night, it was so much fun but I had my notebook, it was my crutch. And I had little sets in my notebook. This can go into this, plus three, plus, you know, and that's real vinyl too. And if I forgot my notebook, oh, my friend was going to meet my roommate and they were gonna get my, <laughs> but, well, I was, yes, it was, but you wean off of that. But like watching the crowd, last night I went into, I did OG Teddy's last night and 
I hadn't been there since the opening night. It, it's changed up a bit. I didn't know what I was walking in on. I didn't know what the op- you know the guy who started the night was going to be playing. There was a DJ after me. Is it thirty-five year olds? And I had so much fun last night. I mean, those are the beautiful nights where you just get to play stuff you really love and um, and just kind of go with the flow. I don't know walking into a set what my first song is or what my fiftieth song is. 99.9% of the time and there's a few things good morning America that you have to you know kind of organize but um, that I will hear a song on the radio in the car while I'm driving over there and I still listen to the radio because that lets me know what's being fed into people's ears all the time mm-hmm. um, but that I would just get inspired off of something and that will be my first song you know um try to appreciate and breathe in the moment the moments that you have. Um, uh, everyone has a different vibe to them. I've, you know, a different niche that they're feeling. Some, you know, I was like, oh, who would ever be called DJ Pussycat or DJ Cream or like some of these more overtly sexual. I've, I kind of think businesswoman first, sprinkle in the sexy second. Um, uh, but ever to each his own, you know, I think trying to be the most authentic self and if the world could just do a few more a few less a few less selfies that'd be cool too especially <laughs> if the guys are getting on this tra- train too i don't know but um but you know off being authentic and and keeping it real and um and and you know yeah that's what i would Good. say Great advice. Okay. Tell people how they can reach you on the social media side, <laughs> website, all that. All 57 handles. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are we still doing two Facebook pages? I want I want people to get to tell me. Like, do we still have our personal Facebook page plus your DJ Facebook? I think maybe scaling back a little yeah. bit at this point. And so, yeah. yeah. Just your DJ Facebook page. Okay. No, we're going to do. So Instagram is at DJ Michelle Page, which is DJ M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-P-E-S-C-E. Um, Facebook, DJ Michelle Page, Twitter, DJ Michelle Page. It's just all DJ Michelle Page, and my website is djpage.com. And then Nona Entertainment, how can they find you there? Nona, enter, at Nona, or www.nonaentertainment.com, and our Instagram handle, which you should follow what all these brilliant DJs are doing, um, is at Nona Entertainment, N-O-N-A Entertainment. Lovely. We'll put them all in the show notes. And before, you know, we sign off, uh, I just want to say first, thank you very much for agreeing and being on the show. It's been a pleasure. Very inspiring. I am, as I told you, when I first saw you, 2014, um, you got it. And I just love the fact that you're more than just a DJ. That's really inspiring to me. So, you know, we try to kind of follow in your footsteps because you're really setting the standard for what DJ should be both. Are we all more than DJs, though? We just don't always share it. True. Some of us are. But you share it. And you're out there. You do community service. I think using your platform for good is, is, you know, I learned that from the Beastie Boys. Okay, great. See that? <laughs> <laughs> Love it. But please just keep doing what you're doing. Stay in touch. There's a time when Michelle and I were talking about we want to do a slow jam party. I think we should do it twice a year, and we just rock out and play slow jams. I still want to make yes. that happen, so we got to talk about that because I, I love mean, my slow jams. So. I'll be sure. Guy, Troop, Mary J. You're just preaching, you know, Tina Marie, I, I, all that old some stuff. Some new Frank Ocean. Yes. I'm gonna, yes. Frank Ocean is uh, even booed up. That yes. song is hot. So, Ellie May, I think is how you pronounce her name, LMA. And so, yeah. So, I just want to say thank you. Look forward to working with you in the future. And we let our guests leave the show with any last minute words of wisdom or advice. I know you just gave some for like the up and coming kind of kids, but this can be more general. So, what we'll do is we'll say thank you again and any last minute words of wisdom or advice. Take us home. End captivity of animals. Use your metal straws or don't use straws at all. Keep hip hop alive. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. <laughs> and the turntables. Yes. Cool. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Amani Experience Podcast. You can check out the show notes on amaniexperience.com slash podcast. Feel free to email us at podcast at amaniexperience.com. Please remember to leave us a review on the platform you are listening on. And share this podcast with anyone you feel would benefit from listening. See you soon for our next episode.